let's start this. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is the uh, second to last justice forum for this uh, for the spring semester. Um, as always, I want to thank everyone who makes just for the possible, starting with Aileen Geely, who actually supports it um, as the director of the uh, Society of Fellows. Um, Kate Suffern, who is, uh, is uh, here with whom we collaborate. Uh, Lindsay Sham, obviously. Sylvia, who makes everything, everything possible. Um, and uh, of course, and of course, Andy Park, um, who is here today with us um, to talk about antiquity bound in the maximum security of women's prison in Mexico City. Um, I want to say that Andy is um, Andy is a very, very, very old and very, very, very dear friend. Um, but he's not here because he is neither. He is here because he is uh, an incredibly important, incis incisive um, intellectual, scholar, thinker. Um, he has managed over the course of his career to change many ways of thought. Um, I um, probably since um, sexualities and nationalisms that he co-edited, um, moving on to um, performances and performativities, um, which I will refer to, going on to uh, the translation and uh, editing of uh, Jacques Ancier's uh, The Philosopher in His Poor, um, going on to tackling something that is still uh, under researched and underdeveloped in theory, which is uh, motherhood in his the theorist's mother. Um, Andy and along with his collaborators, but Andy on his own um, has been uh, extremely influential in my in my thought. Let's sorry. Um, he um, from very early on, since I was still a graduate student, you're not that much older than me. It's just that you started mm -hmm. very early. Um, and he's going to talk about this uh, performance of Antigone in, uh, in uh, a women's prison in Mexico City. I wanted to um, start off by saying that one of the ways in which more, more recently, um, Andy actually made a, a incredible contribution again uh, to the way in which I think about, about things is um, when I was writing about uh, a performance of inputs that had taken place at Sing Sing uh, in, uh, in 2016, uh, about which actually um, Lawrence Dutt wrote in, in, in the Times. Uh, that I will just say a little bit more about this in a, in a second. But as I was as I was trying to uh, write about what performance means in a place of confinement or in a place that has a dissonant uh, presence, um, I went back to uh, Andy and Eve's um, uh, edited volume on performance and performance activities. And I just want to read to you this. In, in that in that volume, uh, and it, it actually go straight straight at uh, J. L. Austin, and and say that um, this is what I, this is how I I got to it. Uh, reading J. L. Austin on performance and performativity, Andrew Parker and Sedgwick have warned against both Austin's normativity through the explicitly performative. I, I do take this woman and it's dialectic, right? So both both the normativity <clears throat> and it's dialectic, the disinterpolation of don't do it on my account. Writing on the edge of this dialectic, 
uh, Parker and Sedgwick find the space of the performative on the surfaces that constitute their communicative plexus that brings together words with their acts. When they write, and I quote here, arguably, it's the aptitude of the explicit performative for mobilizing and epitomizing the transformative events on the interlocutory space that makes it almost irresistible in the face of a lot of discouragement from Austin himself to associate it with the article performance and to associate it by the same token with political activism or with ritual. So in other words, I read this, even when performance and the performative are properties of a theatrical performance, they are, Parker and Sedgwick tell us, almost a priori, primarily, actively political. They not only participate in the construction of the space of the polis by providing a topos, but they also give away tropos for such construction. In reading Austin's formulation of performance at this oblique angle, Parker and Sedgwick retain, nonetheless, the foundational prerequisite of performance as posited by Austin, namely that performance and the performative deal almost exclusively with the detritus of speech, with the margins, with that which is not necessarily readily or intuitively included in hegemonic and or official discourse. So Andy has always worked his, his research, his scholarship, his thought, his intellect, have always been on that space which has been has been pushed to the margins. It's been, it has always brought it into the center of the discussion. So, without saying one more word, <laughs> here you are. That was very lovely. Um, of course, as you read from the introduction to performity and perform per performance and performativity and performance yes. after all these years, I still can tell which sentences Eve wrote. Of course. <laughs> I'm sure. um, it's the ones that really are the country wants. Um, um, thank you. And thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, and to see everyone on a night like this. <laughs> if, if, if I were me, I'd be watching on Zoom. Um, but I'm glad that you all came out. I have a little bit to say and a little bit to show. Um, some of what I'm showing is actually coming around the room. There's a, a book that um, commemorates a, um, uh, an, an accomplishment in um, uh, uh, women's prison uh, just outside of Mexico City. And um, it's, it's a gorgeous production, and the book does it justice, and I want people to have some sense of what, what was possible in, in that. Um, so, um, in November 2018, I visited Santa Marta Titla, Mexico's maximum security women's prison, as part of a collaboration between the Programming Arab Literature of Rutgers University and the uh, Gender Studies Department at UNAM. Mexico's National Autonomous University. The collaboration was funded by the now completed Mellon project called Critical Theory and the Global South. Um, the purpose of this project was to encourage people from the global north to learn something about the global south and um, to, pre uh, to produce new syllabi for courses in the north that would include work that came from this to change the way the theory operates north and south. So we gathered in Mexico City uh, for a workshop on the topic of critical and decolonial pedagogy, especially as it relates to issues of feminism and gender. Two questions that guided this week was how is it, how is a critical decolonial classroom or university constructed? How is a critical decolonial curriculum constructed? In seeking out answers to these questions, scholars actively observed how teaching must accommodate everyday violence in precarious contexts, such as the prison and the university system, especially public universities, 
during times of civil unrest. And in Mexico, at this moment, the contemporary tragedy of mass violent disappearances of young women. It was in relation to these questions that we visitors learned about mujeres in espiral, um, women in spiral, the justice system, perspectives on gender and pedagogies of resistance, which is an alliance between women incarcerated in the Santa Marta, Marta Acatita prison and UNAM students and faculty. Facilitated by Professor Marisa Velastegui Goitia of UNAM, who is the chair of the Gender Studies Department. This, uh, it's a Basque name, which is why it's in Arms, many, many Basques. This alliance has worked for more than a decade on behalf of these women's access to education as well as to legal representation. Santa Marta at, at the Titla is known in the US, if at all, for permitting children up to the age of six to live with their incarcerated mothers. Though the prison establishment claims that the presence of young children works to suppress violence, Santa Marta Acatitla is very much a modern maximum security prison, except for the fact that most of the space within the prison is open air. You see many walls, once inside, but very few roofs. Um, and you see something of the spatial configuration of the prison in a, a video that we'll be playing shortly. In the years just prior to our visit that week, these walls were transformed by Mujeres in Espiral into murals that remade or unmade the prison experience. Deserser la carcel. The collaboration was documented in a book that is making the rounds and a video that you'll see in, um, and um, which attracted a lot of attention. Um, I could do a voiceover. Um, <laughs> um, so um, this is a report of, um, um, uh, this is Marisa, my counterpart, who um, is, was the force behind uh, um, describing the book in, in front of the walls. Um, these walls were, were worse than institutional looking walls. Um, and the, uh, what, what you see is the ways in which they achieve a, a kind of dimensionality um, a, a, they become a kind of habitat that responds very much to the, this is what, what, what it looked like before. Um, um, this is um, one of the incarcerated artists who was responsible for um, thinking the iconography of, um, in, uh, that you see on the walls, but also the color scheme. Uh, other thing to, to, to think of is just how Huge, these walls are how tall they are. So they're about as certainly as tall as these walls are in, in this room. So that there's a lot of space to cover, which means, amongst other things, there's a lot of paint to buy. Um, and you see how um, gorgeous this wall is. So if Marisa uh, could hear her and um, um, she could be saying something about this is 
a face of prison education in Mexico that should be better known. Uh, we will talk about what it will take to do that. That's, that's the reason. We're going to be able to put this in the chat in the Zoom. This is for, for those of you at home. Um, this is the cover of the book that commemorates this project. Uh, um, this project has been publicized in different ways. Marisa, in uh, an article, um, um, the title of which is The Pedagogy of the Spiral, Intimacy and Captivity in a Woman's Prison, that talks not only about the collaboration um, uh, between incarcerated people and, and faculty and students, but um, uh, art as the, the, the what what would bound them together in, in this work. Um, um, other people have been writing more recently about the configuration of space and the uh, uh, importances of art um, and other media um, uh, as uh, you know, Of, of, of art and of the media that uh, tra can, does, can transform the experience of prison life. Um, our delegation was invited to the prison to see the movements and to talk with the artists about their work and their aspirations. We didn't know when we arrived that we were also to be shown a short video that the artists had just completed to protest the terms of their imprisonment. It was entitled The Antigones of Santa Marta Agatit. I don't have access today to this video, and I hope somebody does, but I remember it vividly. I'll say what I recall about it in a minute. Sophocles' Antigone is easily the most translated and performed play from the ancient Greek world. And I say this hoping that I'm not going to be immediately contradicted, but I think it's true, at least. Eventually. It is, it is, it is, it is. <laughs> it's dramatization of the conflict between the law of the state and the law of the family has resonated in Western thought ever since the philosopher Hegel found it to be a touchstone for modernity. In the past half century, antiquity has been reinterpreted and staged throughout the world as a feminist play celebrating Antigone's resistance against her uncle, Freemont. Latin America has led the way in adaptations of Antigone. I think numerically this is, this is the case. Moira Freidinger makes the case, quote, that Antigone is Argentina's national play thus dislocating an unquestioned assumption about whose culture and for which time period Antigone belongs to. So it can turn out that just about every nation in Latin America can make the claim that Antigone is their national play. Um, um, of this, the, the book that, uh, that you see here on this, uh, on this slide, Antiquity in the Americas, a recent book by Andres Fabian and now Castro. That's a quote that, uh, that tries to explain what it is that brings antiquity to the forefront of the imagination, political and aesthetic imagination. Enforced disappearances are then understandably the main object of contestation of postmodern Latin American antiquities. This explains then, if you think, which country in, in Latin America doesn't have a history of disappearance. This explains the focus of the chapter that he's writing on Ariel Dorfman's widows in Chile, 
Sarah Rodriguez and Kigona and Gonzalez in Mexico and Patricia Vietos of Los Escogidos in Colombia. These are by no means the only antiquities to have been rewritten in Latin America, which has accumulated dozens of antiquities. Get the idea. I, I want to just share with you a quote from Sara Uribe, um, who is and and Gona Gonzalez um, is a book of prose poetry and uh, drama, but it's um, after antiquity. Um, the blurb on uh, uh, the English translation of the book um, says that she came to widespread notice with her collection in which she uses the myth of antiquity as a poetic metaphor to draw attention to the growing number of missing persons in Mexico. 90,000 people, this was 2012, 90,000 people have disappeared without a trace and their numbers continue to rise. Like Antigone, the figure, um, the uh, uh, protagonist of this prose poem is desperately seeking her missing brother. Well, this year's Poetry International Festival delves into the poetic body. Oribe's poignant poems enable us to feel what it means when there is suddenly nobody there. Since she is unable to tell the story of the missing persons, Oribe tells the story of the tirelessly searching loved ones who remain behind. In the midst of atrocities and despair, Antigona Gonzalez offers hope by naming the disappeared, giving them a place to exist in her beautiful but harrowing poems, albeit only as a man. It's a wonderful book, and um, it's available in a very good English translation, too. But the performers and video makers of the Santa Marta Atifa Antigone had something else in so another recent book on um, uh, Antigone in Latin America. So this is the cast and crew that produced this video, which was uh, under five minutes, as I remember. Um, this is a brief synopsis by um, um, one of the graduate students from UNA who was working alongside on this project. In the original myth, when Antigone disobeys and faces the ruler of Thebes, she is condemned to die and walled up in a cave. In the rewrite, instead of hanging herself, she takes the noose off of her neck and, like the inmates, in a different kind of imprisonment and suffocation in prison, demands a fair trial with a gender perspective and respect for her human rights, in which the judges take into consideration their life contexts and the reasons that led them to venture into risk and crime. This antiquity is not about justice for the absent or the disappeared. It's about those who are present and who are standing up for their rights. Thus, uh, Antigones de Santa Marta Catifa enacts a different form of justice and a different kind of prison arts education. I hope their example will give us something to talk about. Thank you. Um, thanks for. Um... Giving us this all this food for thought, and we will and surely we need to have a great discussion. I um, I want to I want to ask. I know that there is, um, as you said, I mean nothing has been produced or rewritten more than Antigone in the world, and I think that Bruce Steiner somewhere at some point says that. In, just within the 19th century, there were an exorbitant number of, of translations of Antigone. I, you know, 5,000. Yeah, 100,000. I mean, I think just, just, yeah. Um, 
so, but we, you, you actually um, showed why Antigone is um, so uh, inviting uh, to the thoughts of all people who are thinking or experiencing uh, confinement, thinking of confinement and experiencing. Um, I, when, uh, when the men at Sing Sing actually put up, it was, um, I remember asking them, asking some, some of them who were in production, were in my class at production. Um, I said, why it is? Because I was expecting, uh, you know, a, a, an edifice, a theoretical edifice, right? You know, Oedipus and, and Creon and um, the, uh, the uh, transgressions of power. I was expecting all that. And what they said was that they picked it was because it was easily available for the better. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but, but putting up on Oedipus, they actually came to think upon the play and they came to think about how um, how it actually did have something to say about the uh, about the uh, the experience, the, the be being in being there, right? Um, and it was an Antigone are closely related. So um, I wanted to ask if uh, you have, um, I mean, in all this incredible. Uh, well, scholarship that exists on antiquities in, in Latin America, if there is anywhere an opening for that which is, uh, you know, the the result of serendipity, is there someone who says, well, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what antiquity was about, but, but once I knew, I actually saw how it could actually speak to me, or I could speak to it, right, or I could speak to her, and I could be her, or I could, I could resist it. Are there such spaces, such opening spaces in the in the literature that actually deals with Antigone and the writing of that and that to have you? Um, in, to, my sense of it, and I was suggesting, is is that the, the preponderance of adaptations are um, are are focused on the um, the sibling relationship. Mm -hmm. And the recovery of family members, mm -hmm. um, which um, is is uh, such uh, a, a front and center issue uh, um, that uh, Antigone has an appeal because it it seems to answer to that need. Yeah. Um, the I, what, I meant in the in the prisons. In the prisons. So uh, what I remembered in the discussion after was that they um, uh, there was a, a, a reading um, the students and faculty read um, the translation in Spanish, which then had to be translated into indigenous languages, mm -hmm. um, um, so that the um, um, so so that's how the um, the or as to read the, mm -hmm. the video, uh, found out what, what the story was and what they wanted from it. Right. Um, and um, the great power still is the, the power of refusal. Mm -hmm. of why should they why should they consume the story as it as it is as the reason as the enemy um, is scripted when um it, it would be the opportunity to turn it around mm -hmm. um so um what i what i, what I remember the, the the major audience for the the video was our our visitors but also the the, the prison bureaucracy which was there front and center and was incredibly um discombobulated by this by the performance, yeah, by by um, by ending with the, the demand of rights that were not being given. So, 
completely the the, the verbalization of what um, of what Sophocles has not has only implied, right? The the actual uh, claim of the uh, of the of the rights, yeah, of human rights. And so I guess what what I'm, I'm still struck by all this time later is the the creative takeover of the, of the script. Of the script, yeah. Uh, and putting it to a different place. Which, of course, um, I mean, Aristotle would tell us we don't need to do that because, um, you know, either, um, you know, Oedipus is the perfect play, and then Hegel tells us that uh, Antigone is the, is the perfect play, right? So between the two of them, we don't have to do anything. We, we're just, we've learned that, you know, the, there's nothing you can do with, with ancient uh, drama because it's already, it's already there. Right, everything is already there. Um, so this is, I mean, hearing this, the different end end of the ending uh, of Antigone, which, as you say, was the women took over. And thinking about the men at Sing Sing, also, who said it was a library, right? And we just picked it up. And we did whatever we did. We wanted it. Um, there's a, there's a, a a, 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 a chasm that is being created there, right? And, um, uh, in in that um, monolithic uh, approach to to drama, of course, the Sacrament will tell us that um, there are um, ancient drama has been uh, redone, has been redone in, uh, in in the global south for for decades now, right? Um, and it seems that thousands of playwrights and poets and, um, and, and other figures in which show actually utilize the, um, the myths um, in ways that make them their own, they make them to speak to their particular uh, circumstances. Um, so, so it's it's this is it's very it's very interesting the way they you know, actually um, bring together Antigone and the mural. And I want I want to go back to the mural a little bit and talk about let me ask you to to, to talk to us about the mural and the relationship to. Uh, to Antigone, to the play, to the women, to... Um, I, I don't think there's a causal relationship no. the, that there was, um, that after covering the, all that space with, with paint right. and imagery, they then had to figure out what to do next. And um, uh, this production video of Antigone was one of a series they ended up doing um, Podcasts and blogs and mm -hmm. um, lots of uh, handicraft works, um, all in the name of uh, desa, herself, ways of transforming the space, mm -hmm. um, um, making it into their environment as opposed to an imposed mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they saw what they did with the play as, as one of these series of things. The murals being the most spectacular and probably the longest lasting, um, but um, it was only one of a, a, a series of these things. Do you know what the actual life of the uh, of the play was? Are they still putting it on? Are they still producing it? It's... Um, I I think it was it was a, a one one off video mm -hmm. a, a production for video. Um, I don't know again uh, who has it and <laughs> where it is. Um, I, I, I do know that um, during the pandemic, there, there was two full years of, of no contact between people from Mona and people from, from the prison. Um, so I, I don't know at this point whether um, um, relations have, have been restored and what work has been done. Yeah. Um, you know, we, uh, we have here. Uh, Nicholas Kukufa, who um, was part of a um, Hellenic Studies, um, no, Modern Greek Studies uh, seminar last year, who was 
one of the organizers, um, that um, a Greek um, a Greek performance uh, scholar, performance studies scholar, uh, gave about Antigone's in, in Latin America, right? Their so, translation in Greece. And sorry. And their translation. And their translations. Into Greek, Greek. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and I think there are there are many. Yes. There are many, right? So um, the. And, and that's an interesting, that's another interesting point here, right? Um, the way in which Antigone gets disseminated, I mean, it, it just, it, it's, it's being taken up from Greek. It's being translated and rewritten in, um, I don't know, probably every language on, on earth, right? Um, and then it gets, reintroduced into back into Greece, not as a Greek text, right? But as a text that comes from from Latin America, right? The, uh, uh, the, the, the definitively um, Latin American text. And I don't know if you want to talk about the um, the, the the weight maybe that. Uh, is felt or it is being transferred or is being transported um, not from the Greek into Latin American languages, but the weight that the importance that Antigone gives us, or rather that the importance of incarceration in Latin America um, that gets. Uh, that is the labor that that those translations, uh, those rewritings in Spanish or Portuguese or native indigenous languages uh, does. Right? I mean, I'm trying, what I'm trying to ask is what are the different ways in which um, not only the women in prison, right, but primarily the women as well, but also in general, what what is what are the ways in which um, the you said it's it's kinship, but but the 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 different uh, topics, the different um, the, the different topic topic that, that uh, Antigone gives us. What how is it that it actually interacts with the imaginary? Uh, yeah, that's that's far beyond my. Oh, it's not it cannot be. Oh. What I, I, I keep coming back to the the video I saw and the discussion after, which is the um, that the, the the performers, videographers, don't feel the weight that mm -hmm. we're, we're we're describing here that um, the the thousands of years of of thinking about Antigone the performance in every every national um, setting um, that they hear this as a story um, and that they were um, felt free to accept or reject whatever parts of it that sounded like it was useful for them uh, which is which is a, a way that I found um, startling <laughs> Um, and um, had something to do with a, a freedom of, mm -hmm. of in that rejection that um, I found also empowering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the determination to make the prison a home um, is something like the, the, their freedom to take Antigone and change its genre. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is no longer a tragedy. Okay. It's no longer a tragedy because it does not have the weight that it has outside of the, of the prison because it has been transformed into uh, a text or a performance, actually, as, as you said, right? It, it is a performance of, it is a performance of. Mm -hmm. How long are the, how long are the uh, the sentences that were long, long. Um, mm -hmm. So this this is a terrible generalization, but um, 
most of the, of the women I met were there um, for um, either drug charges or murder charges. Mm -hmm. The murder charges were almost always their husband. Uh, and it was almost always because of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, the, the sentences were 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, several of them that I met were just like within the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. Very and you know, again, imagine you have a child with you um, uh, who is there until the age of six, and then uh, and then you don't see the child again except for you know, a rare day of visits. Well, it's it's really interesting that um, you're saying that that um, that they are trying to make the prison into a home. Because um, I know that there are people here who have been in prison for long sentences, and one of the one of the forms of resistance that we find in American prisons is uh, the the uh, utter res resistance to the um, normalization of of the prison experience. Right, so you, you don't you you don't make your prison your home, right? You you're always there thinking that at some point you are really good, right? Mm -hmm. That place cannot be. Um, and I, I'm going to stop talking more than open it up for uh, for discussion, but I think that it's very true. And I'm just thinking whether this is gendered, if it is, this is if this is a gendered uh, response to, to imprisonment and uh, confinement, if it is the fact that women have, I mean, we are being brought up um, to make homes and and to resist um, different years of organization and the objectification of the space. Um, so um, I don't know if, you, if that is something that came up in the discussions that you had. So it's it's interesting, like it's all you know, both parallels and, and contrasts. Mm -hmm. um, as I recall, the mujeres um, uh, in Espiral got started from contacts from the incarcerated women reaching out to the gender studies department because the relationship between the public university and the prisons mm -hmm. very different. Yeah, that's right. So there's turns out that there's a lot of money, as much money as Mexico is, turns out to be a much richer country than it than we thought it was wrong. Um, but the the um, it is uh, uh, the charter of the program at UNAM means there's mm -hmm. outreach and um, uh, the uh, political representation in the central government as well, mm -hmm. so that. Um, so that uh, when you ask for help, um, there, there are people who will be able to, to do this. Um, it makes the university a very different kind of place. Of course. So it's not the analogous to our experience where we have to ask and ask and ask and, and go up against the wall again and again and again trying to get anything done in, uh, in, in the prison system. Uh, it's, it's, um, tail, tail out of, uh, it's the phrase tail out of school. I mean, um, the, uh, this, is, this is also true of public universities in the United States where the, um, the, the, the limited forays into prison education or prison arts education are are, are are really on a shoestring and with with a, a, a string that is can be pulled back at any right exactly um so um if you could you can open it up to discussion I don't know I start uh, with uh, okay, uh, all right so um I am just going this way so I Sorry, I got here a little late. I was, I was curious about whether uh, you said that the women are receiving these long extremely long sentences filed in the other prisons. Uh, is it the same for the men? Are the men being incarcerated for or like the prison time for their wives? Uh, 
if you go um as far as i know they're they're again drug related but the the, the murder charges are drug deal uh oh. not not domestic okay okay but, yeah. okay yes um it makes me think about the historical perspective of, of slavery with black women raising their children and one of the things they used to teach the children is not to look the slave master or the overseer in the eye and they have to show like a sense of like inferiority so when i think about the women raising their children in, in prison it is a form of institutionalization where they um degrading them and maybe minimizing their mentality their movement, emotional stability it's it's you know, the the New York Times article about this mm -hmm. says that look what a great thing this is for the women and for the kids. And um, you know, there's there are other other sides of this story. Well, with that, I, I you know from political prisoners, uh, political prisoners actually have fought to keep their children with them. Um, precisely because it was a form of socialization. Because if they did not have, because political prisoners were all together in the same, same wards, and the majority of women prisoners in, in the Greeks were political prisoners. There were, they, there were very few women who were um, in prison up until the 1980s, very few women who were in prison for other forms of um, uh, violence or not violence. Um, so, so there were women who were political prisoners, and they knew that if their children were left outside, then the state would take them over. And if the state took them over, then the state would socialize them according to, um, you know, they, they would make out, you know, citizens the way that the state wanted to make citizens. So they, the women fought to, to keep their children, their children with them. And there are still a lot of um, men and women about my age and, and older uh, who grew up together in the political prisons of prison and in the exiled spaces of the Indian groups. Um, and they're all leftists as their as their mothers were. Um, so I'll stop. Um, so, Andy, I can't help um, thinking that the performance you described, I really would see, um, but you, you gave us a very good sense of it. Um, I can't, you know, immediately what comes to mind is, um, as an antecedent or whatever, a resonance, is uh, Apple who guards the island, obviously. So, and um, and uh, I, I, want, I want this to increase a part of the gender question. Is that it? Uh, you want to say just a little bit yeah, about that, so that yeah, so that everyone. So, so the island is a play that was performed in uh, 1973, Upper Side, South Africa. It is based on an, on an actual thing. Uh, the play is an Antigone, except that it's really not a version of Antigone or performance of Antigone, but but uh, the play is about two men, uh, in, in, you know, imprisoned men who are. Uh, who decide to put on Antigone for their fellow uh, mates and um, and their cellmates? The, their cellmates, yes, the, the men are cellmates. Uh, this is actual. The, the, these people were actually together. So the play, the the Fugard is also the the writer. They're they're also co-writers. Usually all three of them. Um, who so the play is really uh, describes the the process by which they negotiate how they're going to play it. Uh, in the midst of all the other things they suffer in prison, including terrible violence, humiliation, and so on. And, um, and, and part of it is a, a kind of struggle of the decision of who's going to play Antigone and who's going to play Crayon. The problem of playing Antigone is that the man has to play a woman, uh, and that has to be negotiated between them because that's an issue. 1973, okay, South Africa. Very, very far ahead of its time, um, insofar as um, it involves a certain kind of cross dressing and a kind of gender play that is very conscious in the play. And um, the, uh, so, the, so I think it is never performed. 
But what it is, is really thinking about what it means for Poland to be in prison and what this means for the people who do it. It's a very different kind of version of this play. As we said, and we said, there are just hundreds of them in, in both in Africa and uh, South America context. Uh, anyway, so so I'm thinking, I mean, so so what I was thinking as you were talking and then your conversation with many, that in a way that that which I had not thought before about this play, that that, 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 that that play is also about making a home. It's also about the process of making a home in the prison as in, in, as well as entertaining the fellow um uh, mates and and and, and which is also part of it. It's not just the home cell, but the home, the prison. And um, so, so I, I want you to, to, to think about that a bit and do that, you know, I want to hear what your thoughts are about that, uh, because that to me is this resonance here, you know, the, and the gender issues are very interesting here. And then the, the other thing that I want you to think about, I'd like to hear more about is, is what you started from, about the, you know, how does one construct the colonial curriculum um, and I'm wondering, because that's what it seems like to me, that maybe you were at a workshop and here is this thing that you're describing, which is in some ways a kind of premise. How do, how do you create the colonial curriculum? Well, you can't create it like you create any other curriculum, just simply have a bunch of different works. And that's not enough. You can't just, it's like, you know, you can't have a left curriculum, but it's within a bunch of left books and it's pieces. <laughs> it's a whole other process. So, so I wouldn't have to make that comment. So this is a to be filed under the great minds think alike. Um, when I, I got back from Mexico City, I sent 10 copies of the collection that has the really the island in it um, to the person who was in the um, um, applied aesthetics department who was um, uh, uh, in charge of um, drama video. Um, um, suggesting that this might be another interesting thing um, for the group to think about. I don't really know what happened. Um, I, I, um, I, I, I think they didn't take, take the bait, um, that they weren't interested in some way. Um, I, I, I don't know for sure what one way or the other. Um, the part of, part of the the question of, of decolonial pedagogy is, of course, it's it's not simply replacing uh, or, or or adding new things, um, but it's it's also the possibility of refusal mm -hmm. of you know, and and here the you know, the what, what still resonates powerfully for me is the re is the refusal of the genre mm -hmm. itself. Um, um, not that you know everything that I've been trained um, in this world to want to protect things like the play, its its provenance, its um, um, its usefulness in political contexts around the world, um, and and here it turns out that the most political usefulness of it is is not following the script. Yeah. So I, I unlearned something. <laughs> you got to something. You're in the right place. Okay, so um, I, I'm sorry, tell me, tell, tell us your name. Julia. Julia, yeah. yes, and then, it, and then it's Nicholas, and then Kate. Julia, yes. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And uh, yes, so one one uh, connection I made between the play and the murals is that you were saying this, you know, transformation um, and symbolized by the barbed wire that has been turned into a floral decoration by the woman to um, and then this transformation of the play of uh, the taking off of, of the news. Um, and it did also remind me that um, you were talking about the genre of study, and um, I, I am trained with the classics. And it is true that uh, Plains of the Oresteia, the trilogy of uh, the Man Man, does end in a trial. 
So I thought I thought this like we need some weight as well. <laughs> I like what we think of uh, the uh, of tragedies. But um it's it's like a feminist uh, <laughs> turning uh, reversal of, of, of that because of course West is uh, uh gets acquitted and <laughs> So uh, anyways, uh, but uh, I thought I thought it was a, it was an interesting reversal also on the other side. Oh, it's a fascinating contrast. Yeah, That's yeah. Funny. And and then I also have a question, you have a comment. Um, which is uh, you said you have a vivid memory of this video, and I really hope that somehow we will be able to uh visually speaking, I wonder if you have some recollection of whether it was you colorful as a mood and oh. was there a, like a what, what, what were the props and the costumes so um well, I, I remember it, it was mostly dark uh, in terms of the lighting but there the the props again this is the thing that i, I remember there were lots of paper cutouts mm -hmm. um that uh were meticulously cleaned um and and uh used both in for costume but also stage props. Uh, so um, amongst other things that this 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 is material that was relatively inexpensive and kind of prison guards would think that you can't do much harm with um, um, with um, cardboard or um, mm -hmm. it, it's those dull scissors rather than yeah, children's scissors. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I remember all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of like, was there one who you had impersonating that Tiffany? Or because I've seen the picture, it's it's, it's all good. Uh, was there a chorus? <laughs> um, uh, so th th this is also interesting. I remember that there were different people played Antigone, mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> the chorus would that that Antigone would go in and out of the chorus yeah. as well. Yeah. Which I again I think is if, if you're going to do Antigone, it's a brilliant way of thinking about that stage. Yeah. Good three you. questions. Thank you. Good. Thank you for bringing this beautiful story and sharing it with us. I mean, there are times that I wish that we were living in less interesting times. Mm -hmm. Um I'd like to focus a bit more on the pedagogical <laughs> sort of aspect of this of our role as a connect. Um, I wish we would stop producing Antigones mm. um, in a way that the language that Antigone is employing is not effective language. It, it keeps on trying to the request to bury and learn the ground and write and so far, but it's, it's a play that has a brother killing a brother, that has Antigones as end the way it is. It's, it's a very it, it's a play that I'm always uncomfortable with, even though I find it such a fascinating one. But I feel like we keep reproducing them in, in a way. Obviously, the political change happens when you change the story of the play. I, I was teaching Moraka's uh, Hungry Woman last week, a more interesting and concerned play with Medea as a powerful woman, as a woman, as a warrior, resistant from civilization even though exiles and all the issues with it. Is there a way for us as academic institutions? And I know that many has devoted past the years that I've known her into this, which is a very important to me way of teaching and producing knowledge and trying to think about how knowledge should be produced and the ways we do. Some of us are still within the confines of 116th and Broadway like myself, right? Um, is there a way for us to make knowledge that intervenes with the repetition of antiquities and this constant sort of antiquity and antiquity and antiquity, which is not a good story? To me, I mean, it's a beautiful play, but not a, not a beautiful reality for me. It's, I, I keep, and I know this will disagree with many of this, I keep having what we are in my head reminding me. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And Antigone is the definition of someone who uses that. So, is there a place for us 
to intervene so we stop reproducing them? Is there something we can do as academic institutions in the way in which we interact with the prison system, with understanding of compassion, how knowledge should be produced in prison, right? Not produced outside and moved into prison. Is there something there in your experience of? So this project in the project, you have a response. Yeah, I kind of have a response. I'm, I'm kind of new to this too, but from so far what I get, um, the story seems like in um. This is Egypt. Hello, my name is Egypt. Hi, Hi, Egypt here. is one of our students at uh, JA scholars. Before, a little before, bit. yeah. <laughs> the, the what I was going to say is that um, what I get from the story, I'm, I'm new to this, but. As far as what they is explaining, the story is um, it's an evolution story. That means it's like it's almost like the Constitution. The Constitution is living. It's a living document. That's what it's considered to be. That means it's made. It, it was made almost to change with time. So the story of antiquity, you know, what I'm saying it's conflict, it's opposition, it's you know, what I'm saying it forces in between the evolution. You can take it anywhere you want. You know, what I'm saying it's conflict can be good or bad. Because I can be in conflict to racist bias or whatever. That's good conflict to me. It may not be to the op opposition, though, but it's good conflict. And I'm helping my people. You know what I'm saying? By being a martyr, or you know what I'm saying? By showing martyr. The, the, so the story is, is forced its evolution. It's made to change the town. Every story, the people see things differently. So every story is going to apply to them differently according to one's experience. So when you, when you talk about I don't know if I'm explaining what you're saying, what you were saying correctly, but if you're saying that it should be the, the story of antiquity should be kept in, within its confines as a story, I, you wasn't saying that, right? No. All right, so then, 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 then that's, just, I, that's the way I understood it. But it's a living, breathing story, so we're going to change the time. So, um, um, just as an example, in Greece, in Greece, they may see the story one way. In Africa, they may see the story one way, but depending on the economical, the social status, and all that other stuff. In America, we may see it in a certain kind of way because we sped up a little bit with the dynamics, the, 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 the dynamics that, that, that hit the whole world. So we all see it from you know what I'm saying, different looking glasses. So you know what I'm saying that's why it's never going to be the same. It's always going to be different because everybody is different, ultimately. So. Um, you know, the, um, it's it's still remarkable. I think this is each of this is a, a a reflection of your thought about this play having life. Um, it gets recognized as relevant in different times and places in different ways. So, I mean, that was I've just been thinking about this presentation and. Um, was reminded us of West African versions of uh, uh, extremely postmodern uh, 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 versions of antiquity. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the, the 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 play is never simply staged straight uh, because there's it's always been interpreted in each each new translation and adaptation. Uh, it's not a pretty story. Certainly, that's the case. Um, the what and, and simply from the the academic side of this, that story is changing also um, decisively. That where would we be today without Judith Butler's version? Where would we be before that with the wave of feminist responses that that Judith Butler tweaks you know, to do a queer reading? Um, so that there um, there's the the, uh, the 20th century continental philosophy we discovered. And there's Lacan, and that, that these are all differences that, that also change the conversation in different academic settings. The question, of course, is, is what, what good is that? Finally, if it's only an academic setting, um, we don't know the extent to which the academic is limited. Um, we like to think that there's um, more reach than we, we sometimes are forced to admit. Um, 
but um, part of what keeps us standing, thinking about the classics, is um, how to how to change the reception. We be we be um, Kate has Kate has a, a question. Kate has a question. I, I, I will just say maybe we can come back to it. Maybe the answer to your question, Nicola, is precisely in your question. We can come back to it, and that's why we we can say. That, you know, we make of it what we make of it, and it's always going to be a collection of, of us when we read it. What Antigone will always be what we what we are. But it, yeah, I hope this won't be redundant given everything we've been talking about. But I'm also wondering and it's thinking too about adaptation and resistance, and it's clear the way in which the Antigone is in this project, but we'll write back to talk about this. And I guess I'm wondering the extent to which Hunan and the Antigones needed Antigone, or whether if they had said, oh yeah, we want to do a short film about human rights in a cultural context, whether that would have been allowed to do the university's leverage, or whether this was sort of incognito in their I, I think that's a brilliant way of putting it. I think it was incognito. I, I don't think the performers, video makers, had a clue about Antigone um, were interested in this as a story that people seem to know outside but it, it got the attention of the prison uh, officials um, and, it, and it, it was enough of a, a, a enough of an event that um, outside observers were, were there to to make it a, to be an enormous theater um, so um I, I think this is one of the reasons why the the lack of interest I, I would have heard if if the island was going to be the next thing up on on, 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 on the boards. Um, I, I don't think that their interest ultimately was um, reconnecting with the with the classics and making that work alive again. Um, I, I I think that their desire was elsewhere. Very kind of thing on, on, on basically the other end of the season that I heard uh, was you know thought of uh, Jean Andre's performance uh, in uh, in Nazi occupied Paris with uh, the top brass of the Nazi officers in the front row, a play that was clearly about resistance, <laughs> right? Um, it, 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 of course, Jean Andre is a you know, sophisticated writer who's thinking of he was returning to the classics, but did not. Uh, so it's not, it's not necessary to be. We think about the play for better or worse, and that's not something that we could just at least I don't know how we would. It's it's really it, it really involved, it is about resistance, it's a resistance and justice, and, and yeah, it just is. So therefore it, it exceeds the situation and emerges from the situations that desired and needed. That's why it has so many profound aspirations. But, but, but the island is is a meta uh, is a meta thought, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, and and but why I'm saying is because the the men who I mean it was written by people who were had been under very uh, adverse conditions, very well educated, and also politically very well. Uh, whereas what we're seeing. What you're describing in, that, in, that, in the prison in Mexico City is a prison that has women who have never had the opportunity to get to the point of becoming political prisoners. Right. So, so it's it's from the beginning. The, these are two completely different. I mean, uh, the uh, incongruity of that uh, is is palpable. But yeah, if I, I understand, I just read a little book and said that they had spent years reading a lot of Latin American writers who are very political. So, so it, the book I was reading in the book oh. it said that the murals, the you know, all of the work, I only have to read it. Um, 
So it doesn't seem to be women who just, you know, as you were saying, these are women who were working at the university for years and uh, uh, people from uh, the gender studies, so you know, people who were very political. So a lot of the quotes, all those quotes, and the book was published in 2013, I think it says, and you went to visit in 2018, right? And it said something like, you know, we spent years studying and reading together. I didn't see anything about him. They didn't uh, say we read the classics. Yeah. It was Latin American writers who are very much out. Uh, so anyways, so I'm just saying, yes, yeah, so they may not have been political prisoners, yeah. but it seems like part of the the work that they were doing is to raise consciousness. Um, and and you know, there, there's a way, of course, is that these women are political prisoners. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's the drugs and, and violence. So much violence. Okay. Yeah. No, but this is precisely the point that that you and Eve are making in the uh, in uh, in the performances and performances, right? It's the fact that it is everything. Every, every performance is ultimately political, right? Um, and of course, we have you know Avi Hoffman who told us that all prisoners are political prisoners, but 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 there is a there is a difference between people who. Um, I mean, eventually, right, become part of the political movement and then become political prisoners. And people who recognize themselves as objects of, objects of uh, political when they when they find themselves in, in prison. Right. So the, 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 there's a transformation. The transformation there that we I think that we see. I I see. Yeah. When, when I teach inside the whole time. Those are Latin American who, I mean, people who become political prisoners tend to be the people who have already have had access to education, right? But, so, but everywhere, but yeah. that's what, it, that's what I'm saying about, about, about Mexico, the island. Yeah. So much Black American people who populate the prisons are exactly those happen, right? Mm -hmm. And there are these, yeah. all of um, these other people on the outside of universities and elected, well, what could be considered a leftist university now, but also many of the ones in, in other places where they see their work, mm -hmm. right? Going in and helping um, sort of raise consciousness. But anyways, I wanted to keep your book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it is beautiful. Um, they, they see their work as, as educators. Um, um, I tell my graduate students who were worried about getting a teaching job. He says, well, you know, pretty soon the only teaching jobs that are going to be available are in, are in the prison system. You get some experience there. And, um, you know, the, the um, UNAM is so far ahead of the United States, um, any institution in the United States, in the, the kind of, um, uh, the, the history of its support, um, and not just this particular place, which is close by, close enough. And I should say that the um, it, it, um, when the pandemic began, it was, I think, 13 years of every Monday, the whole day was um, spent um, in the prison. Um, so I, I got also a sense of what that's like to bustle off in a car and it's a 45 minute drive and you're still in um, uh, the outskirts of metropolitan Mexico City um, and um, you, um, this unnerving, can I say that this unnerved for me, it's my first prison, um, the unnerving transformation in which you were progressively denuded of just about everything that you have on your person. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're uh, given at the end of everything that is out of all your pockets, your wallet, your everything. Um, and you're given a little slip of paper, which if you lose, that's it. Um, so you know, you're holding a piece of paper in your hand for your life, for you're not realizing that you're clenching it for the most part. You realize that you that that you now understand the color coding that you had to undergo to enter the prison. That I you had to as a visitor observer 
you had to have red pants. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> you mean like I wear black all the time? Red pants, like, where am I gonna wear it? And I, I was like, you better go wear red, so I wore red pants. Um, we all wore red pants who were, those who were regular observers on Monday had a different color. Uh, prisoners were blue. Um, prisoners who were new, whose um, term wasn't quite set yet, were in beige, uh, so that you're, you're constantly sussing out who's who and what's what and what you could expect. Yeah. Uh, this is a just again as as an experience was uh, startling. Uh, Did you have a question? Yeah, so two quick moments. First, I want to respond to what you said just um, a while ago. Um, how how all sides come together to definitely talk about the two bottom. Mm -hmm. So uh, a different version of the story. Yeah. And an example of that was um a more modern story versus antiquity. Um Galileo Galilei. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm talking about as far as far I don't know the whole story, but I know it's opposition. It was science against, you know, the, the, okay, you know, so it's the church. Exactly. Church and state science against yeah. the religion or whatever, or beliefs or, or belief in whatever metaphysics or whatever that he practiced, and it was the opposition. He even got his head cut off for that. Well, he didn't, but well, he did it for real. Well, but that, yeah. I mean, that's what I thought. That know, was the whole point that he did, that he wouldn't get his head cut off. Yeah, but but it, 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 so he did. It? No, he didn't. Oh, okay, he didn't. Yeah, he walked away. He, he wrote a letter to to Christina. He wrote a letter to Christina. Oh, yeah, he put that. He put this the force on. He wrote a letter. To yeah, but but you see that we want to. You see what you know, the guy the letter want to. It's something something similar like. Like like as far as Antigone, you know that Antigone, um, she wanted to bury bury someone, whatever she got that belief of system from that time, yeah. that point, whatever she had the idea from, she wanted to do that. But they already probably had other ways where like they burned the body or put it over the water, you know, where that's the smoke go up in the air. They probably had that kind of way or some other kind of way, because they were in opposition to her wanting to bury the body. So and you know, creeps. Got involved. If I'm not I'm saying it correctly, I'm the whole story, and I read a little bit. Uh -huh. And um, that's that's the opposition. It's the same thing as God, 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 God. It's the same thing. I'm saying happens with us in New York City versus everywhere else. Yeah. It's the so I'm, all I'm saying is that we come together through modern. So I like to see the difference. So I like to see the same, the sameness in it, like moving on as a ultimate with evolution. So is it um. We can just look at the um, the ways in which uh, Antigone might be um, perhaps uh, an emancipatory text, mm -hmm. and not necessarily a text of submission or a text of um, loss, mm -hmm. but a text that can give people either the sense of home or the sense of being or the sense of constantly changing. Um, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Right? I did. Constantly changing, even within the confines of a prison, right? So you are a prisoner or you are a non-prisoner or you are a woman or you are not a woman or no. if you are a woman, you're not a woman, right? So um, constant, constant change. Um, do we have? Yes, so, so, um, just, I, this is also an intervention that really spoils a great question. Now, who asked that question? That yeah, was an amazing question. The uh, sort of what role the image case sort of showed them was the intervening of disrupting the partial state. Um, I mean, it, I don't think you need it because this is a perfect time. I'm going to interrupt right now. Just asking questions like that is a it's a great way to interrupt it causes folks to sort of interrogate the beliefs about things they might not, not have thought about. Uh, and in simple ways to interrupt. Uh, who hears me call the jury duty? Anybody ever call the jury duty? No, I don't You don't have to take the streets and fight police. You can go to jury duty, and if they ask you to send a young kid who's 17 to jail, mm -hmm. possessing 
uh, five bags a week. Don't vote not to convict. Those are ways. To, those are ways to interrupt. Those are ways to disrupt. It sends a message to the state that we're not going. Uh, it doesn't have to be that you, you know, that you go out and speak to these signs and not. Ah! Those are ways to show the state that we're not going. To, we're not going to accept the status quo. Uh, it can be done quietly. Uh, it doesn't. You don't need a specific time, place. Uh, teach your students these things. Teach, teach your family these things. Your kids, your loved ones. Uh, those are ways to interrupt. Uh, I just love the question because it's something I constantly think about. Uh, that it's something we constantly ask each other how can we interrupt? How can we intervene? Uh, and the work that Danny does, uh, and so many in this room do, uh, uh, they do an amazing job of interrupting, disrupting. And uh, you never know. If you, didn't, if, you don't, if you didn't know who they were, you never know. And they just do a phenomenal job. So I, don't, I don't think it necessarily has to be anything huge or loud. Yes, yes, with the um, one of the men taking their children six, it could be looked at as Jan six, like, but I think it's commendable for them to allow them not break up their home. But have any studies been performed as to like the uh, progress and development of these children after they? Um, it's a great question to have. Um, there is there is a very good study in in Greece about the children who grew up um, with their mothers in uh, who were political prisoners uh, who grew up in the in the prison in the exile. Uh, it's a study that was done by uh, um, a social psychologist Mandola um, Yani, and she followed because um, there are a lot of them. Increase. Um, she followed uh, a great number of them, and the, the, one of the things that she actually um, saw was that they most of them grew up with a sense of border, bordering on. Uh, paranoid uh, uh, disorder. Right, that was that was the the ultimate the ultimate uh, result that she uh, I mean, the conclusion that she came up with. Um, but there is there was another there was, there's another study which is not about children who were imprisoned, but um, it was a study about torturers. That Mekhaza um, Duros did, and what she did was that she <clears throat> she looked at tortures during the Greek dictatorship, and she saw that that um, every single one of them came from middle of the road politically middle of the road families, right? So they did not come from extreme right wing. They did not. They did not come from people who have collaborated with the with the Germans. They, they, they were people who were the, the parents of the of the tortures, were people who were uh, mainly indifferent politically, and and the entire uh, study, that entire study is how can you make someone, how can you turn someone into a torturer. And, and she saw that it is very easy to do that systematically, right? Um, the the only um, the, the only thing that's missing from that study is how would because these were conscripted men, right? So that they the state had access to them anyway. Um, the the one thing that she hasn't looked at she couldn't um, was whether children of leftists families could also be trained to be torturers. Right? And that that's but but that, that's within the very specific um political landscape, right? Where the right wing was the in in uh, in power for 80 150 years. Um I, I reread Fanon's Wretched of the Earth recently mm -hmm. and the passages that really stood out to me were the case histories of the torturers 
who developed terrible psychological symptoms, and Fanon is there having to cure them. <laughs> um, that it, it turns out torturers are people too. Uh, yeah. um, at least that's what Fanon shows. I mean, with that's what that makes it more exactly. Huh? That's what makes it more exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And then they had they had adverse reactions to uh, it's not easy being a torch. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. Uh, <laughs> being a torch with it. Um okay. Um do we have other questions or comments? Um no, do we have any questions from the uh, okay, good. Um well I need to thank you all. You don't know? thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have dinner downstairs, and so that thank you to Ivan and to, to Cedric and to Nitush who transported it. Uh, and I'm very good recommendations, I'm sure. Um, and thank you so much. It's great.